Welcome into the Tech Ed Podcast. My name is Matt Kirkner. I am your host. As our audience knows, we are the number one podcast in all of technical education streaming in 128 countries on 43 different podcast platforms. We reach so many people every single week with great stories and great information, moving technical education forward as we secure the American dream for the next generation of STEM and workforce talent. You know, we talk a lot on the Tech Ed Podcast about machining, about production machining, about contract machining, and we know that there are all kinds of applications for machining technology. One thing we haven't gone all that deep on is this whole concept of Swiss machining and what that is, why it's important. We're going to do that today, cover that topic and many more topics with my friend George Medaya. George is the Vice President of Operations for Sugami America. George, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. We're going to have a great conversation about all kinds of machining technologies, how we get people excited about the technology you spend time with every single day, how we make sure that the people on our manufacturing floors are familiar with the end use of the parts that they are producing, and also how we get technical education excited about Swiss machining. But let's just start out with a simple question about Swiss machining. What is it and why is it important? Swiss machining is basically a short-term lingo for sliding headstock. Okay. So the difference between conventional turning and Swiss machining is you're taking the bar, grabbing it a headstock and pushing the bar stock through the tool versus in a traditional lathe, the bar is fixed and you're pushing the tool through that. Got it. So if, if we're thinking about a traditional machining center, we're, we're taking our bar, we're fixing it in a machine tool, in a uh, work holding fixture, I should say, and then we're machining that part. And in this case, the stock is actually moving through the machining center. Is that correct? That is correct. That's a turning center. Got it, through the turning center. So what are the benefits of manufacturing a part that way versus a traditional machine part? Back in the 1800s, a design came about for watch parts, which are very complex, very small, very tiny, very intricate, and difficult to make. And then in the late 70s, early 80s, armature shaft, things like that, everybody thought it was you needed a long, thin part to validate or use a Swiss machine on. And today they're used for everything. So it's a great universal tool for all types of part manufacturing. When I think of Swiss machining, I think of like a watch part or a a gear or a very precise machine part, but you're telling me that that doesn't necessarily have to be the application for Swiss machining? No, we've done everything from simple pipe fittings, complex aerospace parts, implantable devices for surgery and things like that. So the whole gamut of industry There's a wide variety of parts that are made on Swiss machines very effectively. Got it. So if it's not just for precision parts and there's all these other applications and all these other use cases for Swiss machining, what are some of the other reasons I would choose this process versus others? Speed. You can make parts generally. If they fit in a Swiss machine, you'll generally make them faster than you would on a conventional turning center. Your tools are closer. You don't have to move as far. Your accuracy is repeatable. You don't have to wait for uh, turret indexes and things like that. Just a variety of different parts. Accuracy, again, if you're doing close tolerance work, the Swiss machine lends itself to that just by its design. Got it. So it has tons of applications. You talk about speed, obviously, in this world of manufacturing where we're trying to always maximize throughput, produce as many parts in as short a period of time as we can, eliminate waste in manufacturing. These are all the types of things that you're talking about. So whether it's producing parts more efficiently, whether it's producing precision parts, all kinds of applications, why wouldn't all parts be Swiss machined? Is there some reason why we wouldn't? We're limited to our size. Most Swiss machines are 38 millimeter and under, which is inch and a half diameter bar stock. There's still a lot of parts that are way outside that envelope. But generally, anything inch and a half and under, we can handle in the Swiss machining world. So in as much as we're reaching a huge audience of people in technical education, lots of teachers, instructors, students, learners who are learning various types of machining, are there different competencies or skills that a machinist or a machine operator needs to have working around Swiss machining as opposed to other types of machining? Creative mindset. You know, I think every good machinist is a very creative person. They think differently. They think outside the box. On a Swiss machine, you can take that creativity and really flourish with it tool zones, tool paths, things like that. You can get creative in what you can do. You know, we also, we always talk about dropping a part complete. So you're not only turning a part, but you're also machining a part. You're drilling, tapping, milling. 
You can do helical interpolation, all kinds of different things on a Swiss turning center that is also part machining center. So it's really fun to work on if you're an application engineer. And we think about manufacturing. I just a couple of days ago, I did an episode with Barbara Humpton, who's the CEO of Siemens. And we were talking all about just that it's really the greatest time in the history maybe of manufacturing to be in manufacturing with all the advancing technologies, whether that's industry 4.0, smart sensors, smart devices, data acquisition, artificial intelligence, and so on. So it's a really exciting time to be in manufacturing. One of the things that people probably outside of the manufacturing world don't really always recognize is, you know, they use the term creativity as, as a skill or as a competency that's important for somebody working around Swiss machining. Many people looking from the outside and looking in wouldn't necessarily think of being creative as a key aspect of working in the world of machining or manufacturing, but you're telling me that's one of the absolute top competencies. Am I hearing that right? That's correct. Yeah. We have 19 application engineers, and if I gave them all apart, I would say half of them would all program it differently than the other half, just huh. because of a different tool path, different insert, different way of doing things. So it, again, it's your, you know, your mental aspect of the part processing and things like that, that you as the programmer can bring to the manufacturing of the part. So we've got this situation where we want to make sure people are bringing creativity, they're bringing their most interesting and fascinating ideas and ways of approaching a problem. To your point, we'll probably find numerous different ways of manufacturing the same part. Maybe not one of those ways is necessarily the best, although it's a great way for us to share best practices and and compare best processes in order to, like we said earlier, drive waste out of manufacturing. So for any of our individuals, any of our students who are thinking about a career in machining, thinking about a career in manufacturing, creativity at or near the top of the list. So keep that in mind. You're not just walking into work and doing the same job day in and day out, especially as you rise into the ranks of leadership in manufacturing. Really, really important to have some of those soft skills like creativity. Now, we're sitting here at the International Manufacturing Technology Show, George, and spending time talking about Swiss machining. And you mentioned the fact that you might have 19 different applications engineers that would program a part differently. Are you programming that on a machine control, obviously? Is that is that fair to assume? Yeah, it's best to learn to program Longhand, that's what we call it when you're programming at the control. Because if you lean on software, you're not understanding what the machine is doing. You need to understand what the control does, what the machine does. So learn longhand, learn how the basic control works. Then you can get into using different softwares and really improve your skill set. That's interesting that you bring that up because a lot of folks are saying, you know, in this age of artificial intelligence and machine learning and block programming and so on that maybe some of those finer skills like longhand programming, like understanding every single thing that's happening in the code, may be less important when we can rely on AI to do that. And what I'm hearing from you is, and you haven't mentioned AI yet, but what I'm hearing from you is at a minimum, we have to make sure that whoever is doing that programming work understands the blocking and tackling of machining and programming. Yeah, absolutely. If you're going to do geometry, you need to have basic math skills. So you don't just jump into geometry in school. So it's the same thing in, in our world. We'd like you to really understand the basics at minimum of a CNC control, how it functions, how you can make it move and do its thing manually. Then we take you to the next step as far as our training processes. Understood. And as far as the machine tools that you're providing to the world of manufacturing, George, what types of controls are are people usually going to see? Are you standardized on one brand or how does that work? We're standardized on one brand. We use FANUC controls for everything, all their drives and servos. Uh, It's a very universal control. There's literally millions of them in the world today on machine tools. Absolutely. So why FANUC other than just the uh, the fact that there's millions of them there and, and you've standardized on that? Are there specific reasons why you, you've gravitated toward the FANUC technology? It's a relationship with the builder. Sugami and FANUC have a long, long-term relationship. And again, the, you know, the other part of it is the uptime, the reliability. We don't have control issues. We don't have drive issues. Customers want dependability when they make an investment. And the control gives us that. Just a couple of days ago, we had Dr. Wayanaba, who's the chairman of FANUC, stop by and his family, of course, responsible for the early innovation of, of CNC programming and machining in general. And certainly the control that's the most ubiquitous across not just the United States, but around the globe. I think here in the U.S., about two thirds of CNC controls that we'll see on machine tools 
are made by Fanuc for many of the reasons that you mentioned. I assume you've traveled to Japan to Fanuc. Is that a fair assumption or have you not been there yet? In the wonderful world of manufacturing, I've been blessed to travel many, many places in the world. So it's another perk about the business. If you get into certain aspects of it, you can really thrive and see different things and lifelong learning. Yeah, absolutely. So what's the most interesting place you visited over the course of your manufacturing career? We will be back to this week's episode in just a moment, but I want to tell you where I am going to be in early December. ACTE's Career Tech Vision happens this December 4th through the 7th at the Henry B. Gonzalez Convention Center located in the heart of San Antonio, Texas, along the banks of the beautiful Riverwalk. Vision is the largest annual conference in the nation for career and technical education professionals and offers you opportunities to gather with your peers and grow professionally, expand your professional development, and ignite your inspiration. There is still time to register. Visit careertechvision.com to learn more about this premier event. And now back to this week's episode. My favorite has been Germany. Beautiful area, Germany, Austria, the Alps. Japan, my first trip there was very interesting. The amount of people, the shocking to a young Midwestern person. Right, absolutely. I've been to Japan, to Fanuc, actually twice in the last seven or eight years to their campus, which is 21 million odd some square feet, I believe. It's absolutely insane. I've seen robots making robots. I've seen their warehouse where they've got literally components for machining controllers and controls that go back to the 50s. So they've never obsoleted a control in terms of manufacturing. You've got a machine tool that's 50 years old, as I understand it. If you have an issue with that control, they've got a component that can replace whatever component has an issue with it. So absolutely beautiful. You know, for as long as we're talking about the globe, Swiss machining obviously got its start in in Switzerland, right? Is that a fair assumption? Yep. Are you familiar with the history or who innovated this initially? A little bit. It was, you know, the Beckler Group back in the day, and then they partnered up with various people, and then they spun off. And that's how all the different genres of European machines, the European Swiss machines came about. Then uh, speaking of beautiful countries, you mentioned Germany, Switzerland is, I was just there about a month ago, six weeks ago, absolutely insane yeah. how beautiful that country is. And I spent some time in, in Zurich and we were in Lucerne, in in, in uh, Interlaken, and then to Lugano. And boy, for anybody that's never been there, certainly beautiful manufacturing, beautiful innovation, a history of innovation and beautiful topography as well. So absolutely amazing. And I would say on the topic of Japan, I've never been anywhere where the people were more polite, the city was more clean, people were more reserved. And and, and frankly, if you love sushi, there's no better place in the world to go than Uh, Japan. I agree. The sushi is outstanding. Absolutely. All right. So let's continue down this path. I want to make some connections here. You know, I, I spent 25 years in manufacturing, by the way. So I was a manufacturing CEO of two companies and a chief operating officer of a third one. The final company that I ran before getting into the education space for 10 years, we had significant CNC capability. And one of the things that I learned the hard way was the importance of not just showing our people how they can manufacture a part, how they can follow a work instruction, how they can you know move their way through education and understand these different you know different technologies, different applications, you know quality, manufacturing, material flow, all these other things. But I learned the hard way that unless we're showing people what it is they're making and why it's important, we're really, really missing an opportunity. Do you see it the same way in the world of manufacturing? Does it matter that somebody working as a machinist or an operator or a quality inspector knows what that particular part does? That depends on the person involved. Some guys just like to make a really nice part regardless of where it goes. But if you get into the medical or the aerospace, it's kind of interesting that you're making a part for the fuel systems or you're making a part for the, it's going to be in the human body somewhere. And it it just, you know, I think that helps add a little bit more pride into your workmanship. No question. You think about working in the field of healthcare or working around manufacturing for healthcare and really recognizing that the person on the other end of that part that you're making, I mean, in some cases you could be making a life-saving device or a device that's going to extend their life. And so, those were the kinds of things, both when I was in machining and metal fabrication for 10 years, and also I spent 17 years in the coatings business, understanding, you know, we might have a manufacturing plant in one case that was manufacturing 16,000 different parts or coating 16,000 different parts for Rockwell automation. And not 16,000 units, but literally 16,000 different SKUs that came through that manufacturing plant. Then we start talking with people about, are right, you're manufacturing this part. 
and that's important, but that part is going to go into a drive. That part is going to go into a programmable logic controller. That part is going to be a DIN rail that's going to hold manufacturing componentry. And here's how that's going to work. You're going to have an operator. You're going to have an engineer in some case. You're going to have a quality manager. You're going to have an entire company that might be relying on your workmanship and our little manufacturing, our little metal finishing operation to run a, in that case, multi-billion dollar company and right. serve a, you know, a, a market that's the size of billions and billions and billions of dollars. So those are always the connections that I like to make to our team members is that, all right, you're, you're fabricating this part, you're coding this part, but here are the applications, whether you're saving lives, whether you're improving production efficiency, whatever that is, so that they really understand the importance of that quality and pride and workmanship, as you suggest. If I'm an operations leader, so let's say I'm a vice president of operations, or maybe I'm a production supervisor, are there ways that I can help connect my team members to the end use of those parts and, and to where those parts are going? Yeah, we generally have a good idea. If you're working on a fuel system component, okay, it goes in a fuel pump, it goes in a car, and it helps provide the impetus to start the car and move down the road. Same with bone screws. We know if they're dental or facial or spinal. So you get an idea where they go and how they work. So it really is interesting to tie everything together. And as you're walking down the road or something, oh, I built a part for that that's in that car. So we, we can agree that there's certainly huge benefits in many cases of making sure our team members understand the use and the applications of the parts that they're manufacturing. And especially, I think, important also in terms of how we attract more and more people to manufacturing and understand that you're not just necessarily standing at a piece of equipment all day. You're using creativity, as you suggest. You're doing really important work in terms of the end use parts. And we're also creating really amazing career pathways for people as they work their way through manufacturing. And so I know you've seen it and I have. You can get started in manufacturing, maybe as a machine operator, maybe as a machine tender, maybe as a quality technician, a quality inspector, lots and lots of different career starting points in manufacturing. And then you work your way up into greater and greater positions of responsibility. Tell us, George, in terms of your career pathway, you know, where you started in manufacturing and then how, I mean, to be the vice president of operations for a company like Sugami America, obviously you've risen to a, a position of high influence and importance and responsibility in manufacturing. Tell us about how you got there. Yeah, it's been a very fun and interesting path I've traveled. I've been in the manufacturing since I was 16. I'm not going to tell your audience how old I am, but <laughs> I started out as a welder by trade. Okay. Was always fascinated by putting things together. My father was a fireman carpenter. We used to build houses on the side. Hmm. Got into the machine shop, loved welding. Then I started machining. Then I started drawing fixtures. Then I started fixture building. And just, you know, when your supervisor sees that you have creative juices and you have a desire to improve, then you will improve. Absolutely. If it's in your, your makeup and your DNA. Then I went on, I got into the machine tool sales role. I did that for uh, a number of years, then went to work for uh, Sugami America, REM sales at the time, indirect sales, then became regional manager, business unit manager, and here I am today. You know what? I mean, that is, of all the people that we've talked to, and I think we're probably episode 185 or so, one of the most honestly fascinating career pathways that I've heard about. But, and I talk all the time about the fact that manufacturing is that place where you can, I say, start out sweeping the floor and end up running the company or get a huge head start through a technical certificate or associate degree or a high school program or whatever. And really, the sky is the limit in manufacturing. So I want to go all the way back to where you started, which is you said you started in production welding. You said you were 16 years old. Tell us about that job. It was for a small, at the time, they were strictly a defense supplier. So Jeep doors, lift gates, all this basic stuff that sure. was, would get worn out and co-op through high school there. My shop teacher's father owned the place, so he got cheap labor. Yeah, right. And you could go to detention if he didn't do a good job. And you so could go to detention, <laughs> right. <laughs> that's awesome. So where did you learn the craft of welding? Did you learn it in a high school tech In high school program? tech yeah, yep. That's awesome. And you grew up in Michigan, correct? Grew up in Michigan, right. Yeah, awesome. And so education pathway, kind of layer that on top of it for us. Education pathway. I'm a high school graduate. I've got some college. School of Hard Knocks was a very awesome, rewarding experience for me. I think today you really need the tech ed. You need the background. You need the advanced math skills. Yep. There's much more the AI, the robotics, the computer things today. It's 
Yeah. Wasn't there when I was coming up in the trade. For sure. Yeah, me either. And certainly watching the way that manufacturing is technology has changed over the course of time is just absolutely fascinating to me. And I do want to get into that a little bit with you as we continue the conversation. But I want to make sure our audience is hearing this loud and clear. And I, I'll just tell you a story. You know, I was in the quotings business for a long time. This goes back 20 plus years. I was chief executive of the largest contract metal finishing operation in the country. Our vice president of operations, who to this day is one of my best friends. I just I just called him yesterday, as a matter of fact. And he's now the CEO of a billion dollar company. He's running a billion dollar company, graduated from high school, went into manufacturing, got into maintenance, got into setup in a machining company. So you think about running around with your car, doing all the setup work and, and setting up machine tools for production. That was his job, had a knack for leadership, a knack for supervision. And over the course of a relatively short period of time, I mean, by the time that guy was 30, he was at the VP level in a manufacturing operation. And then today he's the CEO of a billion dollar company. That still happens in manufacturing. It, it really can. And so as we're talking to young people, certainly education is important. Certainly getting, you know, finishing your high school degree is important. If there's things you want to do afterwards, whether it's a technical community college opportunity, whether that's going on to uh, serve in the military, if a four-year program is your thing, that's fine. But manufacturing will take all comers. And what I loved about manufacturing is that once you got your feet on the ground, nobody really cared about what degree you had. Everybody cared about what you were able to accomplish and what you were able to do and the results you were able to create. So that's, that's just a beautiful, beautiful story, George, that, that you shared. The other thing I thought that was interesting is that you went from the, you know, the operations and the manufacturing side into the business development and sales side. So tell me about that. The business development and the sales side is a very interesting business because you could take your creativity and be a solution provider for another manufacturing firm. You come in, I was an idea guy, I said, have you ever tried this? Have you ever done that? Applied what I learned, applied what I saw. Now, the, the nice thing about being in machine tool sales is you're in a lot of different businesses, seeing a lot of different things, and you can pick the best parts of that and create a, you know, a solution in your head for Absolutely. the customer you're visiting or another customer. You know, when I spend my time, and I, I still do some of it today, but for a long time, I was in and out of different manufacturing operations day in and day out. You can think about working in the coatings industry where you're servicing every type of manufacturing. It doesn't matter if it's appliance, transportation, automotive. We had customers like, you know, John Deere, Caterpillar, Honda, Chrysler, General Motors, Caterpillar, you know, all these all these different organizations that we were servicing day in and day out, and a lot of small to mid-sized tier one and tier two manufacturers that were servicing larger OEMs. I used to say that my day was like watching that show How It's Made. So every day I got to walk in and out of a manufacturing facility, somebody would tour me through the plant, I'd get to see how we made different parts. And I think that's another aspect of manufacturing, especially on the business development or customer service side that maybe gets lost, is that you've got this huge opportunity to meet all kinds of people, see all kinds of processes, and then to your point, really find out where your interests lie and then pursue a, a manufacturing career in that particular area of interest. So I think the second lesson, you know, the first lesson is we can start anywhere in manufacturing and, and accomplish amazing things. The second lesson is that the business development or sales side of manufacturing is a great opportunity to move your way up into positions of even higher responsibility and to meet a lot of amazing people. And then I just want to touch on this. What, so now you're a VP of operations, tremendous amount of influence, tremendous amount of responsibility. And you're going to smile when I ask this question. What's a typical day like as a vice president of operations? Depends on the day. Right. I took this job to help the company out. My day is everywhere from teaching to helping to showing, solving customer issues, uh, preventing customer issues, things like that. So it's a very diverse role. I wear a lot of different hats. So it's kind of fun. I do what I want to do within the role. Whatever team needs help, I basically jump in and help. Well, and I just want to highlight that you started the answer to that question by saying teaching, helping, and showing, right? And I talk with a lot of folks, and, and, and I'll, I'll admit I had this paradigm, you know, years and years and years ago before I moved up into an executive management that, you know, serving in a VP role, being a chief executive of a, of a company, manufacturing or otherwise, was about nice suits and conference rooms and limousines and private jets and all that. And, and, and there's probably an element of that. But 99% of what we do is showing, helping and teaching, which is all about servant leadership, right? I mean, those are all when we think about helping somebody do their job better or showing them how to do a job or, or teaching them how they can be better. We're really serving others and helping them along their career. Is that servant leadership aspect a key part of kind of who you are as a leader? 
Oh, absolutely. You have to. I still mop the floor. I still pick up trash. I still take out trash. I mean, it, the job has to be done and you can't have that's not my job attitude. That, right. That doesn't work at all. Yeah, anywhere, let alone manufacturing. Isn't that exactly right? Yeah. So I we always say, you know, he who wants to be first must be last and, and really put ourselves in a position where we're not above anything and, and no job is too small for somebody leading an organization. And in doing that, you set an, an incredible example for all of the people that you're you're working with. And I think that that particular mindset is going to be even more important as technology becomes more and more ubiquitous in manufacturing, that we can never separate ourselves from serving our team members. We can never separate ourselves from understanding the nuts and bolts of manufacturing, from taking responsibility, whether it's keeping the shop floor clean, mopping the floors, no job is beneath us. But it is going to be an interesting time, I think, to watch manufacturing transform. You know, maybe we'll stick on the topic of machining for a while, because I think as we see more and more AI, more and more smart sensors and smart devices, our ability to gather data about speeds and feeds and temperatures and disturbances and you know, quality issues and downtime. I mean, all of these things, all this data we can gather right at the machine tool. Is that changing the way that Tsugami is looking at the future of machining? We're a data-driven business. Our customers are data-driven. The part process is data-driven. It changes how you engineer the solution. Your tooling, instead of going with your go-to insert, you might have to look at three or four different brands to get better life minimize tool wear, things like that. Uptime is crucial for mm-hmm. customers today. If the machine's not running, they're not making money. Chip control is another issue. You can't have breakdowns because of chips. You can't have tool breakage because of chips clogging up the process. So all these things are taken into account. And then at the end of the day, you know, the parts coming off the machine, you need to make X per hour because that's what you quoted. Right. And every one of those X's has to be perfect. Yep, absolutely. So just to kind of drill down on that a little bit, you know, you think about the world of manufacturing, and and this is a good lesson for any of our students that are considering careers in manufacturing. Every single manufactured part in a contract manufacturing environment, for example. So when when I say that, I'm talking about machining companies in this particular case that are building parts for other companies. So, we, you know, you think about, I'll just use Harley Davidson as an example. That was a big customer of mine for years and years and years. Not every component on a Harley-Davidson motorcycle was made in a Harley-Davidson plant. In fact, many, if not most of them, are made somewhere else and then brought to the plant to be assembled into a final powertrain or a, uh, a fuel tank or a, you know, a motorcycle itself. So we've got all these companies that are performing these contract manufacturing operations. Every single one of those companies is quoting that part. In other words, there's an engineer of some sort of manufacturing engineer sitting down and saying, all right, what are the resources I'm going to need in order to manufacture this part? And based upon those resources, whether that's material, whether that's direct labor, whether that's machine time, electricity, all the overhead that goes into manufacturing, what is my cost of that part? And then, and obviously, in order for that to be a profitable part, we've got to quote that at some amount of, of money higher than the part cost itself. And so what George is talking about here is at some point, there's going to be somebody in operations who's responsible for making good on that promise, because if we're using more resources then what we quoted, it doesn't take us too long, given today's manufacturing margins, to be upside down in that part and losing money as opposed to making money. Somebody's got to keep that promise. And so we have to make sure that we're tracking every single variable as it relates to a good part, making sure that our yield or the perfect parts as a percentage of the total parts is as high as possible. And data is playing an increasing role in that. I had a customer tell me one time, you know, he bought eight machines from me. It was a wonderful order. We got everything installed. And he said, you know, George, you only have to validate eight machines. <laughs> I have to validate 84 features on eight machines. Wow. <laughs> and it all goes back to all the gauging, you know, tremendous investment in machine tools, but that's just part of their process. Right. So we all have to have a little empathy for our customers when they're dealing with automotive or medical. The post processing of the part, everything that follows it is also extremely complex. In a lot of cases, harder than making the part. Absolutely. That was one of the many blessings, and I'm sure you saw it in the same way, working up through the welding ranks and and into uh, into machining. Boots on the ground, working on a manufacturing shop floor, you have an appreciation for that. You have an appreciation for all the variables that go into manufacturing. We used to talk about on a coatings line. So one example would be a copper nickel chrome plated tailpipe on a Harley Davidson motorcycle. Another one might be a zinc plated component in a manufacturing environment on a DIN rail that's holding manufacturing componentry. Every single one of those had 10,000 different variables we used to talk about 
on one production line. And if a few of those get out of whack, that can create a, uh, a yield issue. It can create a uh, quality issue. And, and so measuring and monitoring all that is so very, very important in the world of manufacturing. And I know another thing that's super important in the world of manufacturing is building relationships with education, communicating with whether it's an instructor in a machine tool program at a technical community college, maybe a program director of that. We're seeing more and more machining programs at the high school level with students earning certifications and, and learning the basics of production machining in high school. As you think about that, George, and, and we have a lot of technical education teachers, instructors, and so on that are interested in the work we're doing and listen to the podcast, what should they know about machining in general and then kind of turn that into Swiss machining as well and, and as much as that's a unique part of what you do? Yeah, I think we're seeing more instructors want to be more high tech, I guess you would say, mm -hmm. instead of the basic, this is a mill, this is a lathe, this is what you do. They're talking more about the process and you know, how is a part made, why is a part made. Mm -hmm. We've actually dealing with a couple of technical colleges now with Swiss machining. So we've trained them on the use. So you get, get the basic hands on of it. You're not going to learn everything overnight. I mean, you again, I mentioned lifelong learning a long For time sure. ago on a Swiss machine. It takes a while to learn it, but once you do, it's a skill that you know, not many people in North America have. Right. So it's it's very transferable. But the colleges, the tech centers and that, I think they're seeing that they need to take the next step up other than just the basic, here's your metal shop, here's your degree, goodbye. Exactly. So more drilling deeper and deeper into different types of machining and then the intricacies in this particular case of Swiss machining. You mentioned that there's a shortage of that talent or that there's a lot of jobs out there, very few people have skills when it relates to Swiss machining. Do you have a sense for what the earning potential is for somebody that has those skills and, and finds those opportunities in manufacturing? Yeah, you could have a six-digit income without, you know, if you're an experienced person, driven, you, know, you easily make, you know, seventy-five dollars to $125,000. Again, you have to be skilled, you have to right. be in the right right spot, but it's a very good trade. Absolutely. So which really, really speaks to the importance and the value for our students of exploring possibilities in Swiss machining and maybe they're learning in a high school program, you know, basic machining concepts and, and then moving on through a technical community college and the opportunity to learn Swiss machining and be adept in that technology, minimum seventy five to one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year. Sky's the limit from there. So definitely needs to be on the radar if you are a high school student. And as we wrap up our time together, with George Medaya, who is the Vice President of Operations for Sugami America. That's where I want to kind of end our time is turning the clock all the way back to your high school days. You mentioned, George, that you started working in manufacturing when you were 16, working as a welder, growing up in Michigan. Let's turn the clock back just one year before that. Let's say you're 15 years old and you have an opportunity to give some advice to that young George Medaya. So if you could tell that 15-year-old individual anything in terms of advice that would be beneficial to them as they move on through their life, what would that advice be? Learn a second language and play a musical instrument. Awesome. Okay. So I got to drill on both of those a little bit here. All right. So learn a second language. What language would you have learned? I think Spanish. Okay. And why? You know, that manufacturing is a global economy. It's a global thing. And there are so much we're doing south of the border now. We have a lot of bilingual folks working for us, which is mm -hmm. fantastic. Yep. We can help people, you know, predominant language in North America, second English. I love that. And so that certainly makes all the sense in the world to me. And so and I an opportunity to communicate with a wider variety of people and to you know, take advantage of some of the things that have happened in terms of expanding manufacturing, not, not just around the globe, but certainly closer to home into, uh, into Mexico and Latin America benefits there. And then I have to ask about the musical instrument as well. I will tell you that I was can't say I am anymore, but growing up, I was a jazz musician. I played in a jazz band when I was in high school. Uh, I still pick my saxophone up every once in a while and jam on it in the privacy of my own home. Why would you say learn a musical instrument? I love music. It's very relaxing. And I felt if I could play a guitar or play a piano, it would be more more relaxing. Just the creative side of it. It is a great release and a, and a great way to express yourself creatively. Creativity important in music, in the arts, and as we've discussed today, creativity important in the world of manufacturing as well. George Madai has been my guest. He is the Vice President of Operations for Sugami USA. And George, I can't thank you enough for coming in and spending some time with us on the TechEd Podcast. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And thanks to our audience for tuning in on this week's episode of the TechEd Podcast. 
You can learn more about Sugami America. You can learn more about the conversation we had and the great careers in manufacturing at techedpodcast.com. And you'll find the show notes for this particular episode of the podcast at techedpodcast.com slash Medaya. That is techedpodcast.com slash M-E-D-I-A. And don't forget to check us out on social media. If you're spending time on TikTok, if you are scrolling through Instagram, if you are on LinkedIn, if you are on Facebook, doesn't matter where you go to get your social media, you will find the Tech Ed Podcast there. We would love to interact with you. Let us know you're out there. Thanks for being with us on this episode of the Tech Ed Podcast. My name is Matt Kirkner. I am your host, and we'll see you next week. We'll be right back.